Welcome to the Misophonia Podcast. This is Season 6, Episode 16. My name's Adil Ahmad, and I have Misophonia. This week, I talked to Ben, a high school sophomore in Utah. Ben's miso got significantly worse this past year, and so he's been grappling with that at school. We talk about his efforts to voluntarily try exposure therapy as a way to habituate to triggers. We talk about self-triggers, improv theater, and the lessons it brings um, into dealing with miso. Plus, we talk about miso in the holidays, as well as talking with his grandfather about PTSD from war experiences and what his grandfather thinks of Ben's miso. As always, let me know what you think. You can hit me up on email at hello at misophoniapodcast.com or on Instagram or Facebook at misophoniapodcast. And another reminder, as I always do, to to, uh, go if you haven't already and leave a quick rating or review wherever you listen to the show. It helps uh, bring us up in the rankings and algorithms when people are looking for uh, information and content on misophonia. Thanks, as always, for the incredible ongoing support of our Patreon supporters, if you feel like contributing, you can read all about the various levels at patreon.com slash misophoniapodcast. All right, here's my conversation with Ben. Welcome, Ben, to the podcast. Good to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, yeah, I, I guess, uh, well, the one question I usually ask regularly up front is kind of where are you located? Oh, uh, currently I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. Oh, okay, cool. Great. And uh, yeah, what do you do there? Uh, currently, I'm a student. I'm a sophomore in high school right now. Um, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I've had a... It's, actually, I don't know. It's been a while since I've had a uh, high school. I've had a number of college uh, students. But uh, but yeah, we've definitely had some in the past. So it should be should be quite interesting. Um, yeah. So I guess how are things... For, so obviously school is on. What are we... Yeah. First month of school. How how's it been uh, so far this year? It's been... Uh... It's been different this year, um, not in terms of like, you know, the actual school talk content, uh, but I suppose just jumping straight into things. Uh, yeah, yeah, my misophonia is like, uh, it's grown worse over the summer. So coming back to school is difficult this year. Ah, so, um, over the summer it got the worst, uh, how, how so? Well, I'm not sure what really prompted it, but I know excuse me, I noticed that, um, you know, as summer progressed, uh, and as it got closer to school, I, I was just noticing more and more things, more and more sounds. I was getting triggered by a lot more. And now that school has started, I feel like it's sort of my misophony has evolved to more than just, you know, traditional triggers. It's, um, it's now it's going into like speech patterns and like, things that you wouldn't really consider triggers normally yeah well yeah some people have all you know all kinds of triggers it can be triggers to words it could be triggers to obviously visuals or sometimes touch things like that so um yeah while, while maybe not super common there are you know it's not unheard of to have kind of a, a quote-unquote unusual triggers um but over the summer was was there anything unusual about or anything extra stressful maybe or or that, that you can think of uh not nothing really out of mm. the ordinary um i started working for the first time oh ah, okay okay and how was uh what, what kind of work environment was it uh so i instead of working for you know some big company i um i guess the easiest way to explain it is i sort of run a small business uh i make products out of wood and concrete um, nice. 3D printing things, and I sell them at like uh, local festivals, uh, yeah. like maker fairs, and online mm-hmm. sometimes too. Very cool. And so, oh, that's great. And then, so when you do that, I mean, I guess you're kind of doing it on your own, right? So it's not like it's not like you're uh, sitting in an office around a yeah. lot of other people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. So that's probably not necessary. I mean, yeah, that's interesting because yeah, I would think that that's actually uh, would maybe have helped because. Uh, gives you more alone time it gives you a little bit of uh um an outlet um and so yeah maybe maybe let's go in, let's go let's rewind even further to kind of like early days for you which uh, i guess if you're a sophomore in high school it's not not much far back but uh when do you notice things starting up for you 
Um, well, I've always, when I was little or um, like I don't know, maybe eight or nine, I would, I would specifically, I wouldn't classify it as like you know the pain I feel when I get triggered mm-hmm. nowadays, but I would get really, like, on edge about the way my sister ate. Mm-hmm. Like I would just I would why are you eating like that? And in in the the years after I you know I'd forgotten about that until um let's see sort of maybe last spring spring of 2021 mm-hmm. I um I started having these feelings mm-hmm. of you know like a you know, rage and like uncontrollability and just, uh, you know, pain when I heard eating noises. Was Um, it more than just your sister now? Yeah. It, uh, the main person in my family was my dad. Uh, and you know, it was all I could focus on when I was, you know, at the table or, uh, watching TV. If he's eating in the other room, like I could not handle it. And I didn't understand why at the time. And about around what age were you at this point? Uh, let's see. I was fourteen at the time. Oh, okay, okay. Hmm. Got you. And and what time? Oh, how old were you again when your sister was uh, bothering you? Uh, I don't remember exactly. Like probably yeah, yeah, yeah. nine ish. Yeah. So kind of typical age yeah, range uh, uh, for that initial trigger, and then you. Wow, interesting. So you didn't. You know, then you didn't notice it for a while until around age 14 with your dad yeah Mm. what about at school was it uh were you noticing anything unusual at school uh not really my um my school is uh like the class sizes are on the smaller side so Mm -hmm. and uh we eat lunch in a big open space so there's lots of like sound that isn't eating noises you know talking and yeah you know scraping chairs and stuff uh so no there wasn't really any any noticeable uh triggers at school at the time so then okay so then uh as you know when your dad is starting to trigger which i mean if you, around 14 so that must have been just like within the last couple of years right yeah yeah so did you tell them your parents i mean your family i I was, I wasn't super vocal about it. I mean, I yeah. expressed like it is annoyance. confusing. Yeah, 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 confusion. Um, I had talked to my mom, and my sister about it a couple times, um, but I didn't really bring up anything, uh, you know, any disorders or anything until I started doing research on my own. Yeah. Um, and I mean that's most of the stuff that I learn on my own hobbies and things and stuff for my job, I learn through, you know, researching on the internet. So I've gotten good at it. And at the time, what I was doing is I was, you know, looking into various things that could cause the feelings I was having. Mm -hmm. Um, I got into uh, mostly stuff about either autism or misophonia. Yeah. And it felt like misophonia was like that was it that was what was causing me all this pain um and so i brought that up to my parents um and they were very accepting you know i love them very much it was i don't think it's an easy thing to have your child confront you about you know pain that you might be indirectly causing mm-hmm. you know, it's a tough conversation mm-hmm. but you know they were awesome about it uh, so I just, I, and then after that, I sort of lived with it for a couple months. I didn't tell, uh, my friends or people at school because I was just, I was like, I guess sort of embarrassed that I was feeling this way. It does sound um, weird. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was sort of like, like alienating in a way. Um, I don't think not outwardly, but just in my brain, I felt cut off for a bit. From, um, from uh, like the social situations at school, you know, lunch, talking. Uh, so was well, after your after your uh, you were having sensitivities at home. 
Were you then starting to notice it at school? Did yeah. Well? Okay. Yeah. Um, that's actually that's sort of what kicked off my research. Yeah. Mm. I was, you know, I was starting to get triggered at school uh, just by eating noises at first, but then, uh, you know, the sort of the spectrum of triggers. Oh yeah, yeah. Got yeah. bigger. Yeah. So how did you? Um, so okay. So once you said dualist research. Um, Oh, I don't know, did you come up with some, I don't know, steps to try to, uh, like, how did you um, proceed then? Was it um, maybe starting to tell your friends at school and seeing what they said? Yeah, I actually, I had, um, my dad currently does uh, advertising, advertising for a hearing aid insurance company. So mm-hmm. he has, he knows audiologists and uh, one of them was referred to me as like uh sort of a specialist who Mm -hmm. could diagnose misophonia so a couple months after i you know had explained misophonia to my parents uh we uh sort of we set up an appointment with this specialist and i was like officially diagnosed with misophonia and that's when i started telling people and that's when i started getting uh more comfortable especially at school yeah and how was the reaction that you got at school It's, uh, I don't know. It's not like, uh, not a bad reaction per se, but it's just Mm. not, um, I think I, I might be a bit biased because, you know, I feeling it the worst. Hey, you're a safe space. We, we, everyone listening will, will, uh, understand how you're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It was sort of like a, my friends were sort of it's hard to explain um, feels dismissive maybe a little bit to you like yeah. you, you you came out with this kind of like pretty big deal in terms of like how you feel but it's hard to it's it's it always feels kind of anticlimactic or a little bit of a letdown when others don't take it as seriously as as it's occurring in your brain yeah i think yeah a good way to describe it is it wasn't being taken seriously yeah uh, for sure so, Did you bring it up it, with um, your school, like your school staff at all, too? Your teachers? No, not last year. I mm-hmm. did start doing that uh, the start of this year, though. Um, and what did you get? What was the reaction there? It was, I think, much better because uh, a because I was more comfortable expressing my, like you know, telling them in detail about why I'm suffering from this, mm-hmm. um, and b I was just like a more you know, more mature person. Uh, I was more comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, um, did any of your friends, I'm going to, sorry, I'm flipping back and forth, but was there any kind of like teasing or bullying that came out of it? Or was it just kind of like not really taking it seriously and oh, shrugging uh, it off? No, really teasing or bullying. Um, but it wasn't like they knew about it, but they wouldn't act on it. Like mm-hmm. they wouldn't, mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was a little hard to make them understand if I stepped away from the, you know, where we, where we were eating or if I put on headphones, they wouldn't like, they wouldn't get it. They wouldn't get why I was doing that. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And what did you, um, other than the audiologist, well, what did the audiologist all just do other than the the, the diagnosis? Was there any, uh, tools like, uh, maybe, um, like the uh, widex kind of uh, white noise hearing aids did they offer anything i um it was like a very short um appointment there yeah. <laughs> here's your diagnosis yeah yeah um i did uh i described what i was feeling you know my symptoms and whatever and then i took uh a hearing test mm. you know to test the levels of my hearing um and you know that came back all good i can hear fine but uh after that we sort of we just sat down and talked with the the specialist and you know she she was like yep that's misophonia mhm gotcha where where was this uh appointment by the way it was oh i don't remember specifically okay. it was um like uh 
the U of U, the University of Utah, is. Oh, okay. So somebody there. Okay, gotcha. Oh, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was like Dr. Marsha Johnson or somebody who's <laughs> who's uh, quite well known as an audiologist who uh, um, diagnoses misophonia. Um, mm. Yeah, but there, that's, that, that's she's not the only one anymore. It's great to hear that there are lots of people around, oh, many more people around who are able to to uh, recognize what it is. Um, yeah. Other than an audiologist, did you um, consider um, seeing other kind of professionals, therapists, uh, counselors? Uh, there was talk of like, um, like the audi- the audiologist uh, suggested like maybe noise therapy, or like going to a noise therapist would help. Um, but I felt like I didn't, you know, I didn't understand. Uh, noise therapy at the time as well as Mm -hmm. I do now and I felt like I could you know sort of take it into my own hands and you know uh like self-regulate like I didn't need to spend the the time and the money and the effort on therapy to Mm -hmm. get results that I wanted gotcha okay so yeah I mean a lot of us take things into our own hands because it's a lot of um uh, a lot of different uh, opinions, and uh, it's not a lot of proven. Um, uh, yeah, there's not there's no there's not a lot of best practices. Uh, yeah. How so? Then how did you? Uh, yeah, how did you take the next steps? Um, well, after that, I sort of um, when I came back to school this year, I had uh, I started telling teachers, um, you know, getting like sort of one-on-one deals to see like whether or not I could put in earplugs during class in case mm-hmm. something was triggering me. Um, and then my Spanish teacher told me about the 504 form, which I'm sure you're familiar mm-hmm. with by now. Right. Um, so I applied for a 504 form and it, my application was uh, accepted and, you know, I got it, things finalized and now I have like, um, I can use like earbuds and earplugs. Um, I can change seats if I need to, which is really useful Mm -hmm. uh, to get away from triggers. And I can, I can request like a isolated location for test taking. So, I mean, that was, uh, that was a big step for me was getting the 504 form, but that's sort of the only, uh, you know, structured help outside help that I've gotten so far. Gotcha. Okay. Other than the audiologist, uh, really just, just, uh, getting the accommodations through 504 is, is, yeah. uh, is all you, okay. Gotcha. Um, and then how you said you were, um, you're trying to maybe self-regulate, uh, have, what kind of things have you, have you tried? Um, well, mostly I've, um, you know, I've tried to put myself in situations, especially at home where I'm getting triggered like i'm oh so you're trying to expose myself to triggers Ah, to try to uh you know get used to them more yeah how's that working Uh, not super great Mm, okay yeah 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 Yeah, exposure therapy is um some professionals uh i try to do that or try to um get try to get people used to the sounds um there's different Mm -hmm. names for these things but uh um, yeah, it's definitely not, uh, yeah, it's definitely not something that a lot of me supposed to gravitate towards. So it's interesting to hear that you, uh, um, uh, you know, voluntarily, like, you know, want to try. And, and, you know, intuitively, it kind of makes sense. Uh, it, it's it's like, well, I'm annoyed by certain sounds or I, I have a strong emotion towards certain sounds. Maybe I can get used to it. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think more information is coming out where it's a lot deeper than just uh, um, a sound, sounds that you need to get used to, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, it, interesting. So, um, uh, did you try it for a while? Kind of, where are you in that process? Have you um, are you still are you still, you know, giving it a giving it a shot, tweaking things, or giving up, trying other yeah, things? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm still sort of doing it. Mm-hmm. I'll. Like, I'll give myself a break now and then. I'll eat in my room or I'll put headphones on. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm not doing as much exposure as I was before. 
Uh, but you know, I'm still trying to make make strides. I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, if anything, it's at least you know sort of a placebo effect for me. Like I know, or at least I I believe it should be working. So my mentality is sort of like the longer I do this exposure therapy, probably maybe the better my misophonia will get. And are you are you just just throwing yourself into the sounds? Are you doing something around that, like meditation or just any kind of other mindfulness? Or is it, uh, uh, let me just, it's kind of like holding your breath. Let me just get yeah. into the sound and, and see how long it can last and then try to come up with a personal best tomorrow. Yeah, it's like braving the storm. <laughs> right. Cool. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, no, yeah, I'd be curious to hear. Is there anything else that, you, that you've that you kind of read about that you want to also try out? Um, I haven't done much uh, much research uh, uh, recently, but uh, yeah, exposure therapy is like the main thing I'm focusing on right now. Mm-hmm. Well, the podcast will definitely, if you listen to more episodes of the podcast, it'll definitely, it should give you uh, a lot of ideas <laughs> of, yeah. things, of things to try. A lot of people, um, uh, you know, go to like therapy, talk therapy, uh, CBT, uh, C- mm-hmm. CBT, you know, CBD, like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, yeah, there's, there's talk of kind of uh, dealing with past unprocessed memories, um, there's a bunch of acronyms that are being thrown around <laughs> that are relatively new, but uh, people definitely swear by them, like t- the tapping method, EMDR, uh, sequential repatterning. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's a number of things, although a lot of them do require um, uh, paying for a therapist, basically. Um, but uh, yeah, I- interesting. Yeah, I'd like, love to, I'd love to uh, stay in touch and see how your, your journey is, is going. Um, how have your how how's the rest of your? I'm actually curious, kind of, where's your sister and all this? Like, how do, how does she treat you uh, oh. in relation to the misophonia? Um, it's interesting. She's I'm the oldest of three siblings, um, mm. and you know I think my sister and my brother they understand that I'm being like put off by the noises they make, mm-hmm. um, and they like you know they're empathetic when i need to use headphones and things but it's not like um it's not they're not noticing corrections they could make because i don't know i guess it's because i'm not pointing them out because i don't want to feel like a burden and that's a completely separate issue well i don't know if it's completely separate but it's uh because a lot of us do do grow up with that kind of uh with the shame and guilt and so it's it tends to actually be quite wrapped up into it i mean obviously yeah it's not it's not uh related to the response of misophonia but it's it's uh definitely a very common second order effect yeah uh which doesn't make things better because i think i think what it does is just adds to the stress and i don't know if you've noticed but like stress definitely makes you more susceptible <laughs> To, oh yeah, um, definitely. Misophonia. So that's one thing. Um, yeah, interesting. So your your siblings have kind of a similar response as your friends at school. Yeah, and, and are I your think, parents. Mm, yeah, sorry, go on. Oh yeah. Um, now that I've like, you know, gotten a five hundred four form and things like that, uh, I've talked more about it to my friends, mainly uh, a little bit to my family, and now like people are starting to understand like they're under they're understanding me supposedly more and they have more empathy towards me which is that's really nice yeah 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 have you met other any other anyone else with misophonia i have yeah i'm in uh i do theater at my school Mm -hmm. and currently i'm in the melodrama uh and there's another member in the cast uh who has both misophonia and Tourette syndrome. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this podcast was actually uh, partly inspired by the Tourette's podcast. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. It's a really, yeah, it was a really great, uh, great podcast. Um, 
and so yeah that's that's really that's really cool you said you're part of a, a did you say melodrama yeah uh melodrama is sort of like uh an ironically dramatic play yeah um, yeah yeah. no i, I know yeah. i know the definition of melodrama i wasn't oh, sure, sure if it was like uh the name of your your group or or or, oh. or just a, a i don't know a class that you're taking like is, is oh. it a class on melodrama it's uh i'm in a theater class but mm-hmm. it's the melodrama is like it, after school rehearsals oh kind of okay oh it's, it's just kind of the term for it i see okay yeah i don't know if you're um have thought about expressing or just kind of getting your using using art theater as an outlet or is it just something that you like to do <laughs> and you happen to have met another music phone that way yeah i mean yeah that is i think that's a uh a big part of the reason i do theater um mm-hmm. and more recently actually i uh i auditioned for my school's improv team i got on which is super exciting for me yeah um and that has been that's been like my outlet for expressing you know trying to get through triggers in uh through i don't know i guess absurdity and humor yeah so it's it, you you use improv as a way to just kind of like get the energy out or do you use any kind of techniques from improv to kind of like maybe get through a trigger uh sort of both actually mm. i'll if i'm in a scene um an improv scene i'll I won't directly, you know, reference misophonia. Cause that would right, get right, right. old quick, you know. But I'll <laughs> you, let, you should do that like, one day. Just, yeah, just turn every scene into misophonia as fast as possible and see what, yeah. see how quickly you know. No, anyways, but go, yeah, <laughs> go and tell me. Oh sure, um, it's sort of like, um, I sort of the way I feel about it is I'm sort of storing up all this, this rage and like fear and yeah. pain and like energy that i get from my triggers and i let it all out through improv um and there's i laugh really easily at things um especially in improv scenes and there's like breathing techniques that i've learned from improv that i'll use during a trigger um, oh it's like so what mainly it's uh focusing on the, the pace of your breaths, um, not specifically the breaths themselves, because sometimes that's a self-trigger. Um, right. Oh, but, do you get self-triggered? Oh, that's like that's probably my main trigger is 70% of the time. Oh, dang. It's self-triggers, okay. yeah. No, that's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, it's not unheard of. It's not unheard of, but... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, does it, does it, is it uh, an impediment to going to sleep at night, too? Um, I haven't really noticed um, uh, that yet. I usually listen to music when I when I'm trying to sleep. So, yeah. And I suppose that blocks out most of my own stuff. And is, um, and is it specifically breathing, or is it also the chewing and all that stuff? Yeah, it's mainly uh, eating, drinking noises that I make. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, yeah. it's breathing, like you said. Um, Sometimes it's even if I have the hiccups, it's a really yeah. strange one. If I have the hiccups, it'll start triggering me. Yeah, wow. So it's just general bendness triggers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so okay, well oh, sorry, we went on a little bit of tangent, which is all good. I like tangents. But uh oh, sure. we we were getting back to oh yeah, okay, you were learning breathing techniques that were you were able to maybe transfer back and forth. Um how yeah, okay yeah so so yeah you're like focusing on your breath uh some techniques that you got from improv um you pulled into triggers yeah i've heard definitely like trying to slow down your breathing can slow mm-hmm. down can calm your nervous system which is uh, which is important obviously for many things not just misophonia um i'm curious the breathing techniques in improv where how's it used in improv because i just assume improv is just very fast paced and you don't have time to like you know, think about your breathing. Um, I'm curious how breathing techniques are used in improv. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's 50% like if you're on the sidelines, uh, uh, trying not to laugh. And then the rest of the time is if you're in a scene and you need to, um, you know, appear to the audience in a specific way, 
it doesn't exactly help if you burst out laughing um mm -hmm. it sort of stops the scene which isn't necessarily a bad thing but yeah not preferable i guess yeah, yeah so yeah. most of the breathing techniques in improv are just you know trying to stay focused on the scene and yeah uh yeah very cool okay so you get all your kind of miss your all your miss funny rage so, so tell me about that like uh is, does it mean like you're just angry in a lot of scenes or how, how do you or do you consciously is, is it is, is it possible to describe how you get your misophonia energy out in improv uh sure it's not a like um when i'm triggered of course i still feel very strongly um you know i'll have like sort of a flare-up of emotions i guess you might call it but afterwards instead of like letting the you know usually it's my emotion that i feel is anger instead of using the anger as like oh i got triggered so much today all i can think about is being mad instead of uh acting like that i'll you know i'll start breathing doing breathing techniques mm -hmm. and things like that and i'll just sort of you know calm myself a bit and um you know if later during during improv rehearsal I feel a bit stressed or I feel like I have that I don't know what you'd call it like residual trigger energy yeah I'll, a lot of this like, we, 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 it's hard for us to forget about a trigger a, you know yeah. a real strong trigger yeah um, I guess I'll sort of pour the energy into a scene I won't act like if I'm feeling uh, angry, I won't act angry in the scene, but I'll let the anger guide me into making better improvisational choices, if that makes sense. Yeah, or is it stronger, like uh, more emotional uh, choices? Do you get, yeah. does it become maybe a little bit like you let yourself be less inhibited, even more than improv normal? Like yeah. just, just be more absurd? Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Okay. Uh, do you do any kind of writing as well? Uh, I mean, obviously improv is improv, but uh, um, do you write any kind of theater stuff? Uh, not really. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm not, um, you know, I have English class and I enjoy that, but it's I don't really, I don't keep a, a journal or anything that I write down, like, my triggers and how they feel. I probably mm -hmm. should start doing that, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, it could be worth yeah, something it's when mostly... you become a major, uh, the big, uh, big actor, a Shakespearean mm -hmm. actor or something. Um, yeah. yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, very cool. Okay. And, um, I guess, yeah, so, okay, you, you have that. So tell me about that one friend in theater who has misophonia. Like, did you, did they already know? That they had misophonia yeah was i was um it was during introductions for the first rehearsal of uh of the melodrama and we were talking about uh having a it's called a muffin day where everyone brings muffins we all eat them and talk and rehearse at the same time <laughs> and you guys are like no yeah um yeah so i sort of explained to the group that i had misophonia and she was like oh wait, I know what that is. I have that too. So that was like, you know, yeah. sort of kindred spirit thing, which is, yeah. yeah, that was really nice. And uh, were you able to help each other out? You know, st uh, have each other's back? Uh, in a sense, yeah. yeah. We haven't done much, like, uh, we haven't talked about it mm -hmm. with each other extens extensively. But, you know, I think we both feel like if, the other person was being triggered we would you know step in you know, stop the triggers or like help them get through it somehow gotcha yeah very cool okay um yeah okay hey what about online have you uh reached out to any uh, communities online um i'm part of a couple like uh you know people on instagram that like misophonia memes is an instagram account that i follow and right yeah yeah chloe uh, chloe runs that and she was she was on yeah. that episode uh, uh a while back 
Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also on uh, on Reddit. There's a community called uh, Misophony Help, I think, or Misophony Outreach, and people, you know, voice their concerns about something Misophony related, and other mm-hmm. people respond to it. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. that's helpful too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, any other, like, uh, any other therapies you're uh, after, after, after exposure therapy, if it doesn't work out, do you have, I don't know, from all the stuff you've read, I don't know if I asked you this before, but is there anything else that you're kind of curious about? Um, I am curious about like, uh, you know, just therapy in general. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also sound therapy with a professional would be interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I feel like I'm getting, you know, too overwhelmed on a day to day basis and what I'm doing isn't enough, then, you know, pro- I-, I think I'll start with, uh, you know, your generic level one therapy right? Um, and then see like how I feel about that. Going back, I mean, when, um, I don't know if it's maybe around the time, well, sometime around maybe the time you're sister started triggering you you, was there anything going on in your life for any like um uh, family stress death in the family or anything or moving around uh houses was there anything going on that i don't know could be construed as um just kind of uh, maybe a little bit stressful or difficult for someone your age um not anything specific i remember yeah yeah, i mean i've moved uh multiple times for my dad's work um and but we hadn't moved recently and we were um we had settled in in, currently we were living in in uh boston massachusetts Mm -hmm. um yeah i don't remember exactly why i felt the way i did back then yeah interesting okay yeah a lot of people have uh yeah but a lot of people have yeah, kind of chaos on the home or something, something going on around that time. But uh, you and actually Chloe is another example of someone who can't really think of anything particularly uh, trying or, or stressful around that time. So it's certainly not a universal thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, um, totally. Interesting. Okay. And, uh, and, and yeah, so I guess what do you do? Uh, well, you, I mean, things, holidays are coming up. Uh, what do you tend to do on the holidays? And, you know, obviously your parents are very supportive, but um, do you have big family meals around the holidays? And does your extended family know? Uh, I don't. Most of my family is either in uh, Iowa or Minnesota. So we don't really have, like, family gatherings. Yeah. Um, you know, occasionally my grandparents will come over uh, for the holidays or something and uh usually i'll just try to sit out of meals more like usually as much as i can Mm -hmm. um yeah it's interesting to see this year how um how different it'll be since my uh my misophonia has gotten uh sort of exponentially worse in the past (laughs) yep it'll be it'll be an interesting test (laughs) yeah but um but usually if there's a lot of people around yeah, I can suck if you're being triggered, but there's usually like a lot of background noise and or, you know, if you have to slip out, it's less noticeable because there's so many other people around. So, yeah. Um, yeah interesting. Actually, uh, yeah? speaking of my grandparents, there's uh, one little thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, my my grandpa, my dad's dad was drafted into the Vietnam War, into the Navy. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, he has PTSD now. Mm-hmm. And we, uh, I went over to Iowa uh, to their house this summer and we were talking about the 4th of July. And he gets, um, I guess, sort of emotionally triggered in a similar way that oh yeah, uh, Misos do, like by fireworks. Like yeah. the noise just brings back, um, you know, whatever he experienced, terrible things. Um, and you know i feel like i really resonate with what he was saying and actually recently i was um i was at my school's homecoming football game yeah and every time they uh 
they scored a touchdown, they would light a firework off. And now, I don't know if it's just a coincidence or it's some uh, subconscious mental thing that's now, uh, I don't know, influencing, influencing my miso in some way, but fireworks are now a trigger for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, it's sort of interesting. They'll give me like uh, sort of muscle spasms or uh, ticks, you might call them, where it's sort of similar to Tourette's, I guess. It's mm-hmm. not the same, but when I get triggered by specific things, I I just have like uncontrollable like little bursts of movement, which is strange. Do they continue? Like, is it kind of a little spasm that, that continues after the trigger is long gone, or is it's, it just uh, is it just a single one when you uh, when you hear the firework? It's mainly it's just a big single yeah uh, take, but now uh, actually even more recently, it started. I've started doing like ticks when I'm triggered by specific people eating and those mm. like spasms will it's sort of like a ripple effect like the first one is one big tick and then maybe a couple of minutes later I'll have like a residual um, yeah tick something like that hmm. yeah and uh, and this all started around after you kind of uh, were talking to your grandpa yeah about, yeah yeah but the PTSD stuff um, it, and did you tell him about misophonia? I did. Yeah, I was. That's Oof. how we got into yeah um, talking about his PTSD. Is I was explaining my strange behavior at uh you know the breakfast table and whatever, and so yeah, what that's was how we reaction? got into that conversation. Yeah, yeah. What was his reaction to your um I mean, other than obviously telling him telling you about uh the ptsd stuff was he sympathetic it sounds like he was yeah um i think just like uh i don't know exactly how he felt uh but i it may have been like you know um I'm not sure what the specific word is uh empathy sympathy yeah, yeah, yeah he knows that i'm feeling the same things that he feels so yeah he can you know, he understands kind of, kind of how. Relate. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what do you um? Interesting. Well, you, you're you're still young. You're like a sophomore. Um, what do you have you thought about the future? <laughs> you know, um, as a misophone in terms of what you want to do for work. Um, and what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, if you, can you kind of. Yeah. Um, Until there's a cure. I mean, but. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, I don't know. I'm sort of... Uh, right now, I'm gravitating towards, uh, you know, uh, working in a cabinetry shop or mm. something woodworking related because I have, um, through working in uh, my job, I've developed all these woodworking skills and I take a uh, woodworking shop class in my school. Actually, I have, I have two periods uh, for woodworking, one for a grade and then one uh, that I use as time to, pre- to prep for my job. So I do lots of woodworking and it, you know, I really love it and the machinery actually drowns out any sounds that other people make or even I make. Yeah. So it's like therapeutic in a way. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, that's great. Um, cool. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you have a, a talent for that and uh, a potential path towards something that will be, um, uh, uh, you know, accommodating for your condition, for our condition. Uh, that sounds cool. Um, yeah, well, a bit, I, you know, we're heading to uh, we're around, uh, you know, 45 minutes. Uh, in terms of curiosity, do you have any other, um, things you want to mention, things you've learned, things you're curious about? Um, oh, I guess something that I've learned in the past couple of months is it's easy to take triggers as 
you know, as they happen, as this uh, melodramatic moment, um, like it's very easy to feel like the trigger is the only thing that exists in the world at the time, and what you feel is all anyone should feel when they hear this sound. Um, and I've been sort of experimenting with like uh, different thought processes when I'm triggered. I'll try to, you know, focus on the future instead of the present. Um, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of mention that sometimes it's kind of like, uh, think about it in terms of like, uh, whatever you're doing right now has a finite time and, you know, you'll be like, especially meal time, like, you know, last whatever, 20 minutes and then you will be doing something else in the future. And so yeah. sometimes it's enough to kind of like just calm you that, uh, that part of your brain that's that's going crazy trying to look for danger mm -hmm. yeah that this i mean what you're talking about i think is um uh yeah you're trying to be more aware or change your thought process is very much kind of like mindfulness and even cbt um mm -hmm. it's trying to break um or less unproductive thought patterns that could mm -hmm. put you in that rut yeah very cool um ben yeah i mean this has been great to so always get to have a young person on and it's great to hear that young people now are aware of it along you know long before the rest of us knew what it was when we were you know in our 30s 40s <laughs> sometimes even later um yeah i, I wish you the I wish you the best um and just know it uh your triggers might proliferate but it overall it does get better because as you get older you you can find more outlets like theater but um you know as you leave the house and whatnot you have more control and agency over your environment where you live and things like mm -hmm. that so um so yeah it does get better but yeah. uh yeah thanks for thanks for coming on Ben. this is uh this is amazing yeah of course thank you again ben Really great talking to you. I'm glad you're at least are able to start trying to work through your miso at an early age. And I think you'll be able to cope a lot better than many of us when we were younger. If you like this episode, don't forget to leave a quick review or just hit the five stars wherever you listen to this podcast. You can hit me up by email at hello at misophoniapodcast.com or go to the website misophoniapodcast.com. Easiest way is probably just to leave a message on Instagram support the show by visiting patreon at patreon.com slash podcast the music as always is by moby and until next week wishing you peace and quiet